Hi, everyone. My name is Karen. And I'm Natalie. And welcome to the next page, the podcast of the UN Geneva Library and Archives. Hi, Natalie. Hello. So today I heard that we're going back in time. Yes, we are. Who are we speaking to? Well, I was very lucky to be able to speak with Margaret McMillan. She is an acclaimed historian, author and professor of history at the University of Toronto, and an emeritus professor of international history at the University of Oxford. She's also written a range of books, and you may have heard of some of them or read them. For example, Paris 1919, Six Months That Changed the World, and The War That Ended Peace, as well as several others. And we get to a bit of her books in the conversation. That's amazing. I was also delighted to see that she is a fellow Canadian and that we, in fact, share the same hometown, Toronto. Yes, yes. She's a fellow Torontonian. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, we were speaking online from Oxford, where she's currently based. And despite being in different countries, it was really great to, to connect with her online. Truly the power of technology. It is the power of technology. And technology has definitely grown over time. And she does address that in, in the conversation. I can't wait to listen. So, of course, we cannot not speak about multilateralism. And what did you guys speak about in terms of that subject? A lot. We cover some ground. But looking very much at multilateralism from its roots, which she shares are actually found well before the Second World War and the creation of, of the UN. So she gives some insights on some of the issues, the events, the personalities, the forces that characterize multilateralism and its evolution over time. And what was really interesting in the conversation is that this role is actually taken on by many more people than politicians. So the role of public opinion, NGOs, pacifist groups. Um, and of course, we look at the institutions of the League and the UN and some of the elements actually of the League that continue today, but people might not necessarily remember. It already sounds so fascinating. I know that in addition to being a historian and a professor of history, Professor McMillan is also a published author. Yes, she has several books. And in fact, her, her next book is coming out very soon in a couple of days on the 6th of October. It's called War, How Conflict Shaped Us. So I'm looking forward to, to reading that book. I'm also really looking forward to reading her new book and exploring much of her previous work that can also be accessed in the podcast notes down below. So please check them out. Yeah, exactly. Yes, we have a few of her books here in the library as well. And so before we get to those and, and have a read of those, let's take a listen to this conversation. Hope you enjoy. Professor Margaret McMillan, thank you so much for joining us here on the Next Page podcast. It's great to have you. Well, it's great to be here as well. Thank you. I must say that um, some of our colleagues in the archives are super keen to hear this conversation. They all say hi to you. Well, I say hi back. I'm sorry I can't come to Geneva. I would, I would prefer to do that in a way, but there we are. You're welcome anytime. We're waiting for you here. Thank you. <laughs> so you're an historian, a professor of history an author of several books, and you have a new book coming out very soon on the 6th of October. So I'm looking forward to hearing about that as part of our conversation. But firstly, um, for those who don't know about you, or for those who would like to know more about you, could you tell us more about yourself? How did you come to, to dedicate your work to being an historian and exploring history? Well, I'm a Canadian, and I grew up in Canada. And I had a family that was interested in history. I suppose when I was a child, my parents would tell me stories. And my mother came from the United Kingdom, so I got those stories as well as the Canadian stories. And I just think I had a curiosity. I, I think, honestly, a lot of historians are great gossips. We're interested in people, and we love knowing about people. And, and I found it made me more interested in the past. And I studied history at university, at the University of Toronto, where I had a wonderful series of history teachers and then went to Oxford and, and did more history there. And so I've, I've been very lucky. I've spent my life reading about and writing about something I really like and enjoy. Amazing. I wanted to ask you also, if there was a few words that kind of define what history means to you, what would they be? I think history to me means trying to understand the past, realizing where it's different from the present and realizing it's where the same. And it's part of an attempt, I think, for us all to understand ourselves and to understand the world in which we live. because. The world in which we live is produced by things that happened in the past and forces in the past. 
And so I find history a way of simply understanding more about the world in which we live. But I also find it a subject which is a great pleasure in itself. And the past is filled with interesting stories, interesting people, big questions. Why did the Second World War happen? Why didn't we get a, a Cold War turning into a hot war? These seem to me really important questions and also fascinating ones. And the great thing about studying history is there's no end to it. There's always another period, always another country, always another subject. Well, there, there's a lot that we could talk about today, and I wish that we could talk for many hours, but we just have this conversation. So we thought we could focus on your insights on multilateralism and its evolution throughout um, this past century or so, but particularly the role of the League, um, the United Nations, and actors around that, that sphere, which are subjects or elements of, of many of your books, but not the exact topic of your books. So we're really keen to hear your insights uh, on this. Perhaps we can start then with kind of like the roots of, of multilateral cooperation, especially some of your insights on your book, Paris 1919. What was the, the role of individuals during the Peace Conference of Paris? How did they work to spread their ideas? I think the, the ideas of, of multilateralism, the ideas that countries would have to work together for a common good or, or simply for common peace, which would benefit them all, have long roots. I mean, we, we can go back into history and we can see, you know, the, the Greek city-states trying to work with each other and trying to establish rules and norms and values which would make it possible. And so the idea that peoples who are different and countries and governments that are different is, in fact, can work together is, in fact, a very old one. But what happened in the course of the 19th century was that the world became much more linked than it had ever been before. And that was because of the changes in technology and communications and brought about as a result of the Industrial Revolution. And one of the great changes, which I think is as great as, as the spread of the internet, is the spread of the telegraph network. Suddenly, it became possible for people on one side of the world to know what was happening almost instantaneously on the other side. And what you also had as the 19th century wore on was vast movements of trade, of investment, the spread of communications, but also vast movements of people. And so people in a number of different societies began to think, how do we deal with this? And how do we manage trade so that it doesn't get disrupted? How do we manage the communications network? How do we manage the flows of people and investment around the world? How do we manage the diseases, which also travel as people travel? And so you began to get a lot of talk and discussion in the 19th century dealing with some of those issues. You also got the development of an international public opinion, people in one country getting very interested in what was happening elsewhere. In one of the great international campaigns, one of the first big international campaigns, was the campaign to end the abuses in the Belgian Congo, which was the virtual, virtually the private property of the Belgian king, Leopold. And so we see a number of these ideas about how to develop the ways of dealing with an interconnected world developing before the First World War. Then you began to get the development of international law, international institutions, an international permanent court of, of arbitration in, in The Hague, and big disarmament conferences. And so a lot was happening. And the First World War the Great War, as they called it, of course, at the time, was so appalling and so devastating in its consequences that those ideas about how to build an international order became more and more important. And so at the Paris Peace Conference, there were a number of people there in both leading roles and, and lesser roles and, and in the wider public around the world. There was a real feeling that we have got to try and build a different sort of order. And of course, it matters who is there at the time and it matters who has power and it matters who is prepared to push for things. And what you had at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919 was a number of very powerful men, the President of the United States, the Prime Ministers of Britain, France, plus a number of other very important people. And Woodrow Wilson, the American president, perhaps is identified most with these ideas of internationalism. And of course, it was Wilson who pushed for the establishment of a League of Nations. But there was, in fact, a lot of support on both sides of the Atlantic and indeed around the world for such ideas. But out of the Paris Peace Conference came, of course, a number of treaties, but also came the League, which was, I think, a very important first step towards building an international order. Yeah. You mentioned some, some personalities there. Could you go into a little bit more detail about how they ended up becoming, I guess, protagonists of, of multilateral thought? How did they bring their key ideas to action? Well, I tend to believe that personalities do matter in history. Of course, we know that the great forces matter as well economics, demography, politics, ideas, all these things matter. But you need people who can speak out for change and speak out for ideas. The leading person at the Paris Peace Conference pushing for a League of Nations and for a new sort of international 
border was the American president, Woodrow Wilson. Now, he was a Southerner who had grown up when the Civil War was on, but he believed strongly in a federal United States. He also believed, as many Americans were coming to believe, that the United States was a force for good in the world, that the United States had an obligation to promote its values, which included democracy and, and respect for the rights of small nations around the world. And so he came to Paris with a very clear agenda. He wanted a League of Nations, which would provide collective security for its members, but not just that, which would also promote international values, promote international well-being, promote international law. And he believed, like many people, that the freer the trade between nations, the more nations would be linked together and less likely to go to war with each other. And he believed in the rights of small nations. It, it was a very controversial idea. Um, it often, the term that people often use for it was self-determination. And Wilson himself, I don't think, meant that all small nations should be fully independent. But what he meant was that the rights of different nations should be respected as they were, as he believed, in, in the United States. And so he came something of a crusader with, with a sense that the United States was a model for the rest of humanity. That's a very interesting point you make about small states, small nations. And I wanted to ask you more about that a bit later in, in our conversation. Could we also look at the role of pacifists and pacifist groups in, in the founding of multilateralism, especially as we look towards um, the creation of the League of Nations? How did they interact with governments? How did they spread their ideas that became in the end part of the political ideas and goals moving towards multilateralism? Public opinion was a very important factor as the statesmen met in Paris in 1919 to wind up the First World War, but also to try and create a new world order and sort out some of the many problems left behind by the war. This was something that had developed, this international public opinion, had developed in the course of the 19th century as populations became more literate, thanks to mass education, as communications became better, and as the production of print media in particular became cheaper and more accessible. By the time of the First World War, you were also beginning to get the first broadcasts um, be becoming possible and, and the first films being made, but it was print that was the important medium. You had newspapers with huge circulations in many countries in the world, a million, two million, I mean, circulations that would make newspapers today green with envy. And so this international public opinion is important. It's also important because, of course, most of those in Paris were elected representatives. And so they had to think about the next election. They had to think about appealing to their own publics. There was intense scrutiny of what was happening in Paris. Uh, something like 700 or more journalists were there. And there were also a number of groups, many of which had formed in the course of the 19th century and had been stimulated, of course, by the horrors of the First World War. There were groups that came as lobbyists and pressure groups, pacifist groups. And before the First World War, before 1914, there was a widespread pacifist movement, a uh, middle-class movement, but also working-class movement. And there were international peace organizations, international organizations of jurists, international organizations of, of clergy, international organizations of liberal politicians. And one of the chief things they were, were pushing for and hoping for was international peace. And what they wanted was alternative ways. They came up with very practical suggestions. They wanted alternative ways to settle disputes. And so arbitration, where nations agreed to submit their differences to an independent arbiter and, and be bound by that decision. Uh, international courts. All of these sorts of things were things that the international peace movement was pushing for. And so, yes, at the Paris Peace Conference, both their ideas and their pressures were an important factor in pushing the statesmen towards making the sorts of decisions that they made. Wow. Do you have um, a particular anecdote or example of, of how this played out? I think it was very important for the politicians in Paris to go back to their own publics and say, look, we have made a change. Georges Clemenceau, the French prime minister, did not perhaps believe in the League as much as Woodrow Wilson did, but he knew that a great many French people did. And the same thing was true of David Lloyd George, the British prime minister. They knew that their publics were interested in a different sort of order. I mean, it was, it was contradictory because their publics were also interested in revenge on those who'd been defeated, in particular, revenge on Germany. Public opinion is, is not always consistent in what it wants. But I think there was a real sense in Paris that they better not go home and bring disappointing news back to their people. They, they couldn't go back home and say, look, sorry, we're not going to really build a better world. Um, you know, we're going to go back to where we were. It was a real feeling that the First World War was a turning point and that something better might come out of it. Yeah. Well, then let's move on to talk a little bit more about the League of Nations then. The League, I guess, institutionalized the idea of, of multilateral cooperation and multilateralism. 
as the first global organization. Yeah. So could you share with us um, your insights on this, the emergence of the League? How did these events that you mentioned before its creation culminate to get us there? Well, what was important about the League, I think, was that it was meant to be both a, an organization which would allow nations to talk together and work collectively, but it was also going to have other organizations which would work for the common good. And so the World Health Organization, the International Labor Organization, these were things that grew out of this period. The International Labor Organization was, in fact, set up in 1919. And a number of other organizations came to be associated with the League, the organizations dealing with health, dealing with the slave trade, dealing with the arms trade, dealing with the international drug trade. These were things that the League also took under its wing. But the real idea behind the League was that you would have a body of nations. And if nations were properly run, if, if they were democratic, constitutional, then they could become members. Germany, which was a defeated nation, was told that when it had sort of reformed itself, that it would be allowed to become a member of the League of Nations, which in fact it did in 1925. And the idea was that the nations would meet together, would try and find ways of settling their disputes peacefully, but that if an act of aggression was committed against a League member, the nations of the League collectively would use a variety of sanctions up to and including armed force against the aggressor nation. And so it was seen very much as something that would try and keep peace in the world, but do much more than that. And there was a great deal of hope placed in the League. I mean, we tend to look back at the League now, as I don't need to tell you, as something that didn't work. But it, at the time, people thought it was working and they thought, give it time, it will grow. Woodrow Wilson was, was very anxious that the covenant of the League, the founding document of the League, not be too detailed and too legalistic. Because it said, he said it should be like the British Constitution, which he admired greatly, which was unwritten, which had grown over many years and was really a set of constitutional conventions and understandings. And he said the League should grow in an organic way and should develop. He said, we can, we can set it up, but we can't predict where it's going to go. Of course, one of the great difficulties and, and really one of the most unfortunate things was that the United States did not in the end join the League, which perhaps would have made a real difference to it. Wow. We, we did have an event at the library uh, last week with our historians and, and with some of the members of our archives on the League of Nations Essentials, so looking at ways that perhaps it wasn't a failure, even if it was largely considered a failure. Um, because as you mentioned, the ILO, um, this is an institution that continues today. So I guess some parts maybe didn't work out and some elements of the League and, and how it was forming uh, multilateralism at the time uh, continue today. Well, I think it's very striking that when the great powers met in the course of the Second World War, when the Allies met, there was a lot of talk about a new sort of international organization or an improved international organization. Again, the Americans took the lead in this. President Roosevelt was very anxious that something good should come out of the Second World War. And initially, there was part of the consideration, at least, of simply reviving the League and continuing the League, which had not been wound up. I mean, it still continued to exist in embryonic form. And it was decided that the name and the history of the League was too much associated with failure. And so it was agreed to set up a new institution, the United Nations. But what is really striking to me is how many, both of the personnel and of the institutions of the League, carried over into the new United Nations. I mean, the, United, the League wasn't simply wound up. It was absorbed into the United Nations. I think often people don't realize that. And a lot of the work the League had done was, was not very flashy and not really noticed. But what it had done was, was set up an international bureaucracy which collected information. I mean, a number of really important economists worked for the League in the 1930s and helped us, I think, to understand better how our world works. And so I think a lot of what the League had done was very, very useful. It provided the sorts of information and the processes and the contacts that if we're to have any sort of international cooperation we need, you can't start with nothing. You need to know each other. You need to have statistics, simple things like, you know, how many people live in different countries, Exactly. I also wanted to ask you about this, this, this question of the, the League not suddenly stopping in the UN beginning. It was a transition, I guess, in, in multilateralism as well. With the, the outbreak of the Second World War and the beginnings of the UN, is there anything that really did change that, that you could share with us? What changed in terms of ideas around multilateralism? And, and I guess what didn't? One of the things that I think did change, or certainly was, was, it was hoped would change, was that the United Nations would have more military force than the League of Nations had had. The League of Nations did not have its own armed forces. The French had wanted that. They had wanted the League to have its own 
military, and, and the British and the Americans had resisted that. And the United Nations did have its own military forces, which, of course, still exist today and which different countries, including my own country, Canada, have contributed to and, and taken part in, and, and I think are very pleased to do so. And so that was a difference. And there was an attempt to make the Security Council of the United Nations stronger than the Council of the Old League of Nations had been. The idea was that you'd have the five great powers of the world on it, and that they would have a special position within the United Nations through, through of course, um, exercising vetoes. And so I think the hope was that the United Nations would have more teeth, in other words, more capacity to influence events than the League had had. What also, of course, made a difference was that the United States this time joined. And I think that's very much thanks to Roosevelt, who was very, a very canny politician and who made support for the League a bipartisan affair. He made sure that he had Republicans. He was a Democrat, but he made sure that he had Republicans supporting the idea of the United Nations. Really, I think where Woodrow Wilson had failed is that as a Democrat, he hadn't bothered to try and bring the Republicans along to support the League. And so the United States hadn't joined the League. And so the United Nations was in some ways similar to the League, but it was, I think, more powerful initially than the League had been and had more capacity to exert that power in cases of, of disputes and, and conflicts among nations. I know we've touched upon um, the idea of, of pacifist groups and associations, but did their role change also as multilateralism evolved over these years? How were they able to influence the ideas as the UN was, was founded and created? I think really there's a parallel between what happened with the League of Nations and popular support and what happened with the United Nations. There were in the 1920s and 30s, all over the world, League of Nations associations. And these were often very numerous indeed. It was a very big support, um, big, big association in, in Canada, in the United States, in Britain. The United States didn't join the League, but there was still a lot of support for the League um, among the American public. And so there was, I think, um, a good deal of, of popular support for the work of the League of Nations. And the same thing really happened with the United Nations. I mean, all over the world, as they're still are today, there are United Nations associations which have talks, which do organizations, which try and tell people about the United Nations. I remember myself as a school child, we were taken on a bus to New York, um, down from Toronto, which, which is a long trip. And, it is. <laughs> yeah, well, it was a long trip. A few dedicated and noble teachers and parents came with us. I can't imagine what it must have been like for them. And we were taken to the United Nations. And I remember, you know, this was something that was awe-inspiring. I mean, the idea that there could be some international place where people met and talked to each other. And we still have, you know, a lot of high schools still have the United Nations associations, which do debating and so on. So I think there, there was a lot of support for the League. And I think there was a lot of support for the United Nations. The trouble is, of course, when something goes wrong in the world, people say, oh, well, you see, it doesn't work. And of course, I think we need to look at the times where it has worked, where the League was effective and where the United Nations has been and is still being effective. There's a lot that happens, I guess, in the news about conferences at the UN and, and even about the League at the time. But maybe the change is more, is smaller than that. The steps towards cooperation and collaboration and inclusion is, is seen in smaller steps that don't necessarily make the headlines. It's very important, I think, to remember the smaller steps and, and to look at the work of both the League and the United Nations, all their allied organizations, you know, the work that is done in dealing with refugees, the work the League did in Europe in the 1920s and 30s in running plebiscites in trying to come up with solutions for disputed pieces of territories, the work that the League did in dealing with mandates. Now, you could argue that mandates where the great powers were given the mandate to manage the colonies taken from the defeated powers of, of Germany and the Ottoman Empire. You could argue that mandates were a deeply cynical ploy by Western powers simply to take over what they wanted. But it really was, I think, a step forward in international relations. The idea that you didn't just give a people in one part of the world to be ruled by an empire in another part of the world, but rather that empire had a responsibility to a body above it. I mean, you have, of course, in your archives, all those reports that the mandate powers had to do on the mandates that they held. And like it or not, they had to fill them in and they may have grumbled, but I think it introduced a very important principle that you cannot just take over parts of the world without considering the wishes of the inhabitants. And so I think there's an important step forward here. And the League 
did do those sorts of things. And I think the International Labor Organization, I think dealing with international health, I mean, we know, thanks to the, the pandemic, we've been reminded again, we know how important it is when there is a pandemic that there be international cooperation because viruses do not respect borders. And so I think the league was very important in helping to build that network of less flashy, perhaps, and often not noticed organizations which worked often in very quiet ways, but helped to make the world a better place. And I think the UN has done the same. And what strikes me increasingly about the work of the UN is that it's called in when things have gone badly wrong. When you get a failed state, when you get a war that doesn't end, or when you get a post-war situation with, when, when rebuilding needs, who rebuilding is needed, who is called in? It's the United Nations and its agencies because they have a wealth of experience. They've been doing it for years and they have a respect, which perhaps an individual power coming in and trying to rebuild wouldn't have. Very interesting. We do mark the centenary of multilateralism in Geneva this year, um, as well as last year, but also the UN 75th uh, anniversary this year. So as we kind of see these remembrances of, of where we've come from, do you see any particular principles or, or themes in the evolution of multilateralism that are important to, to remember? What I think is very important is to remember that people around the world have a right to certain things. You know, it's a question of human dignity. And I think that universal sense of what human beings need and, and deserve is very important. I think too often in the past, and we still see it today, we've tended to dismiss others who are not like us as not being worthy of the same consideration. And we live on what is actually a very small planet, which has global problems. I mean, we haven't even talked about climate change and, and the, the challenge that that is posing with increasing urgency to the whole human race. And so I think what international organizations can do is reinforce that sense that in a sense, we're all in it together. Now, it doesn't mean that everyone is the same, and it doesn't mean that everyone is going to live in exactly the same way. But I think that aspiration that people should have at least a chance in life, they should have a chance at least to clean water, to food, to a quiet, a quiet existence, a possibility to bring up their children. These things are very important, and these are universal desires and universal needs. We, we can't make everyone exactly the same, nor should we want to do so. But I think we've got to understand that we share a common humanity. And that is where I think international organizations make a difference. What worries me always is that we get used to institutions and organizations and we don't bother to reinforce them enough. We think, oh, well, they're there. They will, they'll always be there. You know, an institution is only as good as the sort of support it gets. I'm glad you have raised this issue because this was my next question to you about about inclusion in multilateralism and how we can ensure inclusion and diversity and equality. So maybe we could firstly begin with the mention of the global south and, and smaller states, which you brought up earlier in our conversation. How can multilateralism evolve and further improve to bring to the forefront the global south? I think the very fact that the Global South has representation and can make its voice heard is, is a very important first step. And where the UN differs from the League of Nations is that there are far more members. But even the League, which did not have as many members, did give representation to the Global South. I mean, Ethiopia, for example, was a member able to bring its case when Italy invaded it unprovoked. It didn't succeed, but I think it was very important that there was this forum. And the Arab nations, as they became independent as the mandates came to an end, were represented in the League of Nations. I think what the League of Nations helped to do is break down the idea that it is the white powers, the powers in the global north, the empires um, in the 1920s and 30s, of course, it was the British, the French, the Dutch, the Belgians. And although the Americans technically did not have an empire, they certainly behaved um, as if they did. If you are speak to anyone who comes from the Philippines or all parts of the Caribbean, um, you will know what I mean. So I think what the League of Nations began to do is break down that idea that the great powers in the North, in some ways, were more civilized, had more of a right to dominate the world, and began to bring in the notion that nations around the world had a voice and had a right to be heard. And of course, the League did include a number of nations from, from what we would call the Global South, but the United Nations includes virtually, as far as I can remember, virtually every nation in the world. And that's been very important. It's been a very important forum for the nations of Africa, for the nations of Asia, for the nations of the Middle East, for the nations of Latin America to press 
a common cause to raise issues, not always successfully, but I think the importance of a forum should not be underestimated. No. And I guess vice versa to that in asking the question about how can multilateralism support uh, inclusion of the global south, what do you think the global south can help to do to further multilateralism, contribute in a, a unique way? I think what the global south has done is raise the issues that are important to the global south. And it can, I think, through doing so, perhaps begin to bring about change. But what I find also encouraging is that the global south itself is beginning to build its own multilateral organizations. You get international trade organizations, organizations, free trade organizations like UCOWAS in Africa. And you get, of course, ASEAN in Asia, where the nations themselves who might once have seen themselves as less powerful are beginning to assert their own agency and control over their own areas. In Latin America as well, you're getting regional groupings where nations come together to deal with common problems and common issues. And I think that's important. But I think it's also important that they build alliances across regions. And I think that has been very important. And I think, you know, the global south has many different nations and many different interests. So it's not always going to speak with one voice. And a number of those relationships are going to run north and south as well. But my own view is, is the more we have international organizations, whether those are regional or, or, or global, the more linked we are and, and for the better. The more we know about each other, the more we have to deal with each other, the more possibility we have of, of making change. Yeah. I also wanted to ask gender and how gender impacts multilateralism, but also how multilateralism can improve gender equality. Do you have any particular anecdotes from, from history or, or your own insights on this question? I think increasingly women in the 19th and 20th centuries were seeing themselves as women and seeing that they had issues in common and beginning to organize and lobby for those issues. I mean, one of the sorts of groups that came to Paris, I mean, a number of petitioners came to the Paris Peace Conference in 1919 to ask for various things. But among those petitioners were women asking for women's suffrage. I mean, for women, what was important then was the right to vote. And I think it was a very important campaign because if women had the right to vote, then, of course, they would have more capacity to push issues that were of interest to women. For example, uh, maternal care or, or treatment of, of women in various ways. And so I think we've seen an increasing organization of women by women to try and, and promote the sorts of things that they, they feel are important. And of course, what they feel important is different in different generations. Um, once women got the vote, that wasn't the end of the story for women. There, there, there was, as you know, and there still are issues which are, are of particular salience to women, um, trafficking in women has become an issue. It always was. I mean, there was an international attempt and an international outcry about it before the First World War, after the First World War. And again, today, it's something that we're very much aware of. And we're, I think, increasingly aware of the importance of childcare for women, maternal care, proper contraception, um, access to, to, to doctors, um, all the sorts of things that, that are particular to women's health, I think, have, a lot, have had a lot of attention. And I think there's been a real campaign to try and improve the health of women and, and to try and deal with some of the issues such as, as surrounding childbirth, which have often been very dangerous for women in less developed areas of the world. So I think definitely international organizations, both NGOs, but also multilateral organizations like the United Nations have played a very important part as forums and as agencies for promoting rights that, and, and needs that are specific to women. Yeah, and I, I think you make a good point about context and different, I guess, not needs, but demands as well. So at the moment, we are also seeing that there's still a lot of change that is needed to, to ensure true equality. Um, and there's also the, the question of intersectionality. So the, the nexus between race, gender, um, climate change. Was this something that was on the agenda for, for the League or the UN in the past? Or is this something that we're seeing more in, in the present? The notion of intersectionality is is very new, and people wouldn't have talked in those terms. I mean, what they would have, the terms they would have talked in, in in the 19th and 20th, early 20th centuries would be to do something for the poor and the dispossessed and the oppressed. I mean, this was the sort of language they used, and they didn't, I think, make as as perhaps we might do today a distinction between poor men and poor women. Um, we looked at, I think, in those days they tended to see the poor as being the poor, I, and I think also the agenda will expand as, as societies change. I mean, gender, of course, does not just include women. There are gendered issues around those who 
are gay, um, you know, the international campaign on HIV AIDS, I think, and on gay rights has helped to raise issues um, of other sorts of gender issues. And I think they will continue to be raised. You know, this is, I think any institution reflects the interests and the concerns of its time. And often institutions are set up by people who, who and none of us, none of us can imagine what's going to happen 50 years from now. Yeah. And so institutions are set up with one set of values or one set of concerns and other concerns and values will come in to, to change them. This is bound to happen over time. Yeah. As we look then to, to today and perhaps the multilateralism of, of the future, what do you think is the role of, of public opinion? At the moment, as we, as we mark UN 75, um, there, there has been quite a large campaign globally on the future we want, where public opinion is really encouraged to be able to hear uh, what people think. But do you think public opinion has changed o- over time uh, the, or the way people can, can express their opinion? Public opinion is much more examined now than it was. Uh, we now have polls which get increasingly elaborate and, and people study things like social media to try and work out trends, to try and see what sort of words are being used. And it's become a lot more scientific. I mean, there were no polls in the first half, or at least in the early part of the 20th century. I think the first polls done by Dr. Gallup were sometimes in the, sometime in the 1930s, and they were not nearly as scientific as they are today. And so the public temperature is always being taken. Whether that is in itself a good thing, I think, is debatable. I think too often political leaders and other sorts of leaders tend to spend the whole time trying to figure out what it is the public wants rather than providing leadership. And the public, I think, is not an undifferentiated mass. There are different views in the public and and views change. And I think often people don't know exactly what they want. I mean, in Canada, you know, we we get public opinion polls saying, do you want to spend more on health care? And people say yes. And then another public opinion poll asks people they want more tax. And so how do you reconcile those two things? It seems to me that is the role of leadership to try and articulate and, and explain that if we need one sort of thing, we may have to do another sort of thing. At the moment, I think public opinion is in a very turbulent state and is not necessarily, I think, moving in what I would consider a positive direction. I think we have a lot of concern, partly as a reaction to globalization, about others, about immigrants, um, a lot of hostility towards those who are not like us. And I think that's playing out in, in countries, both with democratic and, and authoritarian governments. And I think there are leaders, populist leaders, who will use those sorts of concerns and fears as, as a way of whipping up um, nationalist fervor and, 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 and hostility and hatred towards others. I think it is worrying. I think we are seeing a turning inwards often in people not wanting to consider global issues and then a turning inwards and, and taking um, comfort in, well, comfort is the wrong word, but I think what we're seeing at the moment is, you know, it's, they're contradictory trends in public opinion. And we're seeing in in some countries around the world a rise of populism, which is often um, hostile to those who are different, which represents, I think, a turning in, possibly and and understandably, because globalization has caused a lot of disruption and has not benefited everyone. And we see also those who who do continue and and, or or are beginning to realize that we are part both of our own communities, but we're also part of, of, of larger communities. You know, I am part of my my community in my hometown in Toronto, but I'm also a Canadian. And at times, I'm also part of a global community. So I think we we are not one or the other. I think we're often part of many communities. And I think it is at the moment very important indeed to think, of course, about our own communities. It always is. But to think about the global community, because we are facing global issues, which if we don't deal with them, are going to affect the much smaller and, 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 and better known communities in which we live. And the global issue, of course, is pandemics. I think we are now dealing with the COVID-19, not always well, but we're trying to deal with it both nationally and internationally. And climate change is a huge global issue, which is really, I think, facing us with increasing crises. And so we need to remember, and how we do this, I think, is partly a matter for us as citizens, but also perhaps hoping that we find leaders who will help us to do it. We need to do both. We need to think about what is best for our own communities, but we need to remember that we're also part of a global community, and that's not always easy. And I think there are, as I say, these contradictory trends in public opinion. You know, I don't want to have to deal with others, um, but I'm going to have to. 
you know, even if I want to just deal with what's on my doorstep at home, the world is not going to let me. There will be another pandemic. There'll be continuing COVID-19 pandemic to begin with, but there probably will be pandemics after that. And there will be increased violent changes in in climate, um, the increased warming of the planet. So we're not going to be able to simply shut the door and live in a small community. We're going to be obliged to think of the larger community. And that is what I hope we're going to try and recognize out of this present rather difficult time we're going through. Yeah. As we see multilateralism evolving, before um, more likely concentrated on on states, but now with the contribution of NGOs, uh, the private sector, um, civil society, public opinion, how do you see the multilateralism of the future evolving to be able to meet the, these needs together? You put it very well. I think multilateralism operates on a number of levels and, in fact, always has done so. There is the multilateralism of state-to-state interventions, state-to-state conversations, and there are the supranational organizations which bring together different nations, whether it's the United, the United Nations or the European Union. I mean, these are supranational organizations and also very important. We also have a lot of very specific organizations like um, the International Aviation Authority, which deals only with international aviation. So we have a number, a great number, increasing number of organizations dedicated to a single strand of the many things that, that bind us together. We also have the NGOs, an increasing number in which we build international networks throughout the world. And that, of course, has been fostered by the spread of communications. It's a lot easier now to find out what's going on in another part of the world because the communications are much better. Although, of course, we all know there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation out there. But I think the the growth of both these types of international organizations, which are uh, semi-official organizations dedicated to looking after a particular bit of the international scene, but also the great proliferation of, of NGOs. And then we have things like the internet. I mean, the technology has made it much easier for us to think in international terms and and to try and find out about each other. And pre-COVID, and I hope post-COVID, we have an enormous movement of population around the world. We have people traveling as on business, traveling as tourists, traveling on cultural and, and educational exchanges, and of course, also people moving from one part of the world to another. And this, it is to be hoped, will bring a greater understanding of each other and, and, and a greater sense, um, again, that um, we have a good deal in common, even where we're different. Thank you so much for all of your insights on this issue. I see behind you a lot of books. So before we end, I wanted to ask you about, about your books. I do encourage our listeners to go ahead and look at Professor Macmillan's books because the subjects are truly fascinating. Um, your latest book is coming out on the 6th of October this year called War, How Conflict Shaped Us. Could you tell us a little bit about it? What motivated you to to write this book? I teach modern history, and I've taught modern history for most most of my life. And if you teach modern history, you do come across a lot of war. And I've always been interested in the ways in which wars have affected societies and affected the world we lived in. I don't think we would have had a League of Nations without the First World War, perhaps. And I don't think we would have had a United Nations without the Second World War. I mean, those wars, dreadful as they were, and I, and I, you know, we have to recognize just how very dreadful they were, did force people to think about the ways in which we might do things differently. And so I thought I would, I have always been interested in war. And I was asked to give a series of lectures for the BBC in Britain. And they said, what would you like to lecture on? And, and I was thrilled to be asked to do the lectures. And, and I thought, and I, I said, well, can I try war? And, and they thought it was a good idea. And so I gave the lectures and then I turned them into a book. And what I try and do in the book is not give a history of war throughout human history, and there's been an awful lot of war. But what I really am arguing is that we need to think about war because it is so much part of who we are and it's affected the ways in which we've developed. Because if we think about it, we have a better chance of actually dealing with it and perhaps stopping it. And so I look at things like, why do people fight? How do they fight? How does technology make a difference? Is there a gender difference between men and women when it comes to fighting wars? How do wars affect civilians? How do we try and stop war? And how have people tried in the past to stop war? How does our culture deal with war? So what I'm trying to do is just look at some of the questions that we might all have when we think about war. Wow. I'm looking forward to reading it. Our library has ordered it, so I hope it arrives soon. 
<laughs> you, you're a writer and a historian, so I'm I'm actually curious to ask you what it's what it's like when you explore these subjects and put them into words. What what process do you go through? It's um a complicated process. You 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 begin to think about a subject, you begin to read about it, and gradually certain questions begin to occur. So you think, oh, I really want to know more more about this, or I want to think about this. And I've also been very lucky because I've taught at two great universities, the University of Toronto and, and the University of Oxford. So I've had lots of people to talk to, and I've had very good students who have sort of asked me difficult questions, and, and difficult questions make you think about what you're doing. And you collect material, and then you begin to write. And the days when you tear your hair out and think, this is going nowhere, and I, why did I ever think I'd do this? And the days when it goes better. And then you find you've actually written a book. You know, I start out thinking I'll never be able to write as many words as my publishers want. And then I reach a point where I think, oh, oh, I've written too much. Um, do you have any any tips for for writers out there or budding writers who, who would like to, to get started? I think the two tips I have is decide whose style you like. And, you know, we all read a lot. And look at writers you really like and, and try and figure out what it is that, that you really like about them. You know, I happen to like writers who write in a very plain way like George Orwell, for example. And you know, I'll never write as well as him, but I think that's sort of one of my models. And the second thing I, th I think that you should do when you write is have a reader in mind. Who are you trying to explain something to? Are you trying to explain it to another expert in the field? Or are you trying to explain it, as, as I hope I can do, to a broader public who may not be experts, but are interested in the subject? It's like a conversation. If you're trying to explain something to someone, you have to keep in mind what they know and what they don't know. And you have to try and explain it as clearly as possible. And you mentioned George Orwell. Are there any authors or books that you're inspired by lately that you could share with us? I've been reading a lot of fiction lately and some old. I've, I've reread some Ernest Hemingway, who, when he was good, was very, very good, I think. Wrote, wrote a wonderful, clear prose. I'm just about to start Middlemarch by George Eliot. I've always had trouble with it. Never quite. I've read it once, I think, but I want to read it again. So I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to do that. And I'm reading some modern novelists, uh, an American writer called Richard Russo, who I find very good and who writes beautifully. So I think, you know, I think historians should read as widely as possible. And I think reading novels also gives you a sense of, of what writing is about. I think at the moment, too, fiction is appealing to be able to go on adventures while we're stuck at home. I think so. I mean, I think I have been reading some history. Uh, less than I thought I would, but I've, I've been reading some history with great pleasure. I've been reading a very good book by, actually, which fits the period of the League of Nations by someone called Robert Gewart, who has written a book on, on 1919 in Germany and how the Weimar Republic was set up. And, and it's fascinating. And he, he argues that Weimar was not doomed to fail, you know, that it could have succeeded. And it, it, you know, I like those sort of books which take on the conventional wisdom. Fantastic. Before we go, we've covered a lot of ground today. If there's something that you would like listeners to remember from this conversation, what would it be? Oh, uh, that's, that's, yes. I, I don't, I don't like giving advice, but perhaps at the moment when we are all feeling a bit down and certainly here in, I'm um, in the UK at the moment, people have, you know, just been told they're going to have lockdown again, which is a challenge. I think we need to remember, and, and that's perhaps where history is useful, if bad things don't last forever. And we do have a tremendous resilience. I think human beings have come through appalling crises in the past, and they have managed to rebuild and they've managed to carry on, and perhaps worth remembering that at the moment. That's a really great way to end. Professor Margaret McMillan, thank you so much for taking the time. It's really a true honor to, to speak with you today. Thank you. Well, it's been a great pleasure to talk to you, and, and I hope you have a very good day. <laughs> <laughs>